Hello folks, today we will be going over your own Space Marine chapters. That is your law, law that you've sent in. We did have a very brief brief in what to do when sending in these Space Marine chapters and I will read it out just so you know what the parameters were going into this. I have had a lot of submissions so hopefully you understand why this will be uh, separated into several videos, maybe two or three, because I want to read out everybody's work, and there will be varying de degree degrees of quality. Um, we have people with uh, dyslexic disorder who sent stuff in. We've had people who um, are, you know, the English is their second language. We've had actual writers writing in, so the quality of writing will vary. And so the quality of me reading it out also will vary because I find it very hard to read things not in good English. You have to understand, guys, most of my job is reading essays from high-level university students. These are people who write very nice prose, very nice sentences. So going from that to reading, you know, uh, Hobby Nightmares and Space Marine Law when somebody doesn't really know how to write is a bit jarring for me. So please bear with me, all right? So here was the brief, and I'm going to read it out for you. All right, if you want to be read out on the video, your submission must be three things. Number one, well written. I don't really care about the quality of the law. That's all good. I love reading that stuff out. I mean spelling and vocabulary. Reread your work, please. I don't have a lot of time to do these videos, so can't sit and edit five to ten essays worth of Space Marine law every time I want to do one of these videos. Number two... Try and keep it under two A4 pages max. Size 11 text. Aside from that, do your law in any format you want, with pictures, whatever. And number three, understand that if I get a lot of submissions, I will do multiple videos. If you're not in the first, you'll be in the next few videos. So, if you want to send in your Space Marine chapter or, or bit of law for me to read out, head over to hobbynightmares at gmail.com and send it over there with the preface custom Space Marine chapter or it won't be read out. Right, cool. Jumping in to our first Space Marine chapter and it is the Sons of Freya and this one came with a little message for me to read out which I'm going to do. First of all, enjoy some models. There are some Sons of Freya models. Let's jump into what the, the chapter master said to me though he said apologies mr exile if there are any grammar punctuation or spelling mistakes i am dyslexic no problem man this is my homebrew chapter the sons of freya in seventh edition i ran with a full company of nova marines but my son hated the razzle dazzle camouflage effect their colors had that's true don't you people you can turn people off so he asked me to change the colors uh, I, and I'd skipped 8th edition. Okay. I'd skipped it completely, having started at 2nd edition. And since all my old school minis were uh, were headed the way of the dodo anyway, I thought, well, I could just start one of these new Primaris forces. The idea for them is rather than having Space Vikings, go with Space Norse with a Celtic undertone, as it's two parts of history that I am fascinated with. Hope you are well, Mark. Thank you very much, Mark. And yes, uh, I, I think uh, history is an amazing start to your hobby journey, if that's where you're going with it. But let's read some of your lore, shall we? So we can find out who these people are. All right. The Sons of Freya. I really like like the really bold colour scheme. That is a really bright blue colour scheme. Anyway. A chapter of the Ultima Founding formed after the Lord Commander of the Imperium, Rebute Gilliman, returned to the Imperium. It is it is there for a it is it is, however, a chapter of Primaris Space Marines. Alright. Cool. The Homeworld. The feudal world of Freya, a planet of ice and fire as a volcanic ice world with pine forests and deep fjords. I like it. We're going very uh, uh very Norse. The tribes on the world are of an Iron Age resemblance in culture, and to most, they are considered barbaric, with fierce rivalries between tribes that any native of Fenris would recognise. The tribes' people of Freya refer to the marines of their chapter as the Aina Yar. In the frequent battles between the tribes, survivors who have shown particular valour or received wounds 
that would be fatal to feudal world standards are taken by the All Father's priests, or priestesses, known as Valkyries, to the, to the Volkvanga, a field at the foot of the chapter's fortress monastery, where the chapter's apothecaries and chaplains work through and make selections for potential recru recruits to the chapter, and any females amongst them will be taught the ways of the healer and then will become new Valkyries and the official messengers of the chapter to the tribes and are considered serfs of the chapter in rank to the wider Imperium, but a figure of mystical reverence to the population of Freya. They will bear a golden necklace and tattoo of the chapter's symbol, a combined Elder uh, uh, Fourth Arc rune that resembles a H with a broken up spine to the untrained eye. And authority, from this point, from this point on, sorry, no harm in any way is to invoke the wrath of the chapter, for they are the eyes of the chapter on their world and are considered wise women, but not rulers to the tribes and are free to roam where they please. I like this so far. I very much like this so far. This is a very, a very elegant combining of Viking culture and, and, and Celtic rites. Now combining them together and putting them on a Fenris-like world. I like it so far. I'm getting a, a lot of Sumeria out of this, a lot of Conan the Barbarian out of this, which is no bad thing. Trust me, I love Conan. Um, one thing, though, I will point out, not 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 as a, a as a gotcha. This is to help you with your own law and to and to, to bring it into um, compliance with 40k overall, right? Mm. Any warrior fighting in war already as an adult, is too old to become an Astartes. So an Astartes is somebody who is taken when they are 13, 14 at most. And they start the process of becoming a Space Marine, right? Before they hit puberty. Or, at the very least, when they're in puberty. You know what I mean? Um, so a fully grown adult wouldn't be able to become a Space Marine as we know it. Unfortunately. It'd have to be somebody younger. So, maybe you can change the law... So that if a warrior does well, his sons are automatically drafted into the into the chapter, right? So you've got say say you've got somebody called I, I, Ivar, right? Ivar's fighting away on Freya, and he's doing really well, and he's killed loads of warriors, right? He's got seven wives and nine sons. Well, the chapter come in, they say you're a good warrior, right? The Valkyries pick him out as a good warrior, and they say, right, how many sons do you have? Right, I will leave you one to carry on your genetic line. The rest of them are joining the chapter. That would be a good way of getting around it, right? So, yeah, fix your law there. Just uh, maybe amend it for that. So, the beliefs. In fact, actually, I was going to... Um, ooh, I was going to just use the pictures here, but this is a good Word document, man. This is great. All right, let, let me just set up a, a window capture here. One second. There we go. Now you're reading what I'm reading. And you can see one cool thing. Look at what he's done down here. Look how cool this is. How cool is that? Love this. Absolutely brilliant, mate. What a what a good piece of law building this is. Alright, anyway. I'll come to that in a minute. Alright, the beliefs. The beliefs. The chapter sees the Emperor as the All-Father, as they have wholeheartedly embraced the culture of their new homeworld, which shared many similarities with ancient Nordic cultures of Old Earth. They show reverence to all the Primarchs equally. The Sons of Freya rely heavily on their librarians, known as Runeseers, with every company having one permanently attached to it. They are regularly, regularly consulted before making any big action. Where the rune seer will cast his runes to see if there can be any further insights gained for the coming battle for, from the Allfather or his chosen Einrahar. They believe that if they die in service with their honour intact, then, uh, then when their time comes, they will be by the Allfather's side in the final battle alongside him and his chosen Einrahar. Okay, cool. I like this. Very normal. Space Marine law. Do you know what I mean? Very normal law. You'll hear this quite a lot with, with Space Marine chapters. It's kind of what they do. You know what I mean? When I die, I will go and fight by the Emperor's side. Yeah, standard. But sometimes standard works. Sometimes it just works. Anyway. 
The Sons of Freya are one of the more humanitarian chapters, possibly because of them freely mixing with their homeworld's population after ascension to full Astartes so long as their duties permit it. Ah, that's quite rare. That's quite rare. Yeah, most Astartes leave and don't come back. That's quite rare. Their physical appearance and attitudes could be mistaken for a space wolf if it wasn't for the absence of the pelts and elongated canine teeth. But like the wolves, they have been witnessed uh, uh, doing drinking, uh, drinking copious amounts of strong mead and ale, along with decorating themselves with woad war paint, and they tend to be perceived by others as to never take anything seriously. Though this is a falsehood, and honour is everything to the chapter, and jewels, aka an holm gang, will be used to settle disputes of honour. This would usually be till the first blood is drawn, though it should be noted that this is not always the case. Uh, such as when a dispute between Jarl Guthrum of the Third Company and Castellan Rimaz of the Black Templars, where the Castellan insulted Jarl Guthrum by implying he was trying to avoid combat for refusing to advance on an orc horde to protect civilians. Guthrum punched the unfortunate, uh, uh, the unfortunate Templar, breaking his helm in the process, and then challenged him to, an, uh, to a Holm gang. The Castellan, looking confused as to what Guthrum meant, uh, till a till a Gothi, whom had served who had served in the Death Watch, told him, "It was a duel like your feasts of blades, only at an agreed upon time, with a ring of our brothers and yours to witness the the settling of honour. You wear no armour and are only allowed a standard shield and sword or war axe. In the ring of honour, you have three spare shields. With the first dr blood drawn, the defeated party bows." and concedes that honour is redeemed. As is a uh, mattering of personal honour, you must fight yourself. No champion can, can take your place, though I doubt this will be an issue for you. Okay. Rimaz and Guthrum's uh, home gang was a display that none could dispute, though the Castellan had lost only two of his shields. The R managed to, to draw first blood, and the hot-headed Castellan refused to submit, feeling cheated, and struck out again at Jarl Guthrum, at which Guthrum took offence, and rolling aside a blow, lashed out with a quick blow that took the ill-fated Castellan's life. Though honour was restored, the loss of the Castellan resulted in the Jarl Guthrum handing, handing the Black Templar's next Castellan a mastercrafted weapon from his personal armoury as an apology. Unfortunately, the new commander of the Black Templars, not understanding the magnitude of the gesture in the customers of the population of Freya, and still angry at the loss of Rimaz, threw the weapon to the ground in disgust and stormed off. Since then, the rift of mistrust and disdain between the Black Templars and the Sons of Freya has not dissipated, and the two chapters will always fight each other's lines for signs of treachery. What Jarl Guthrum's gesture meant was that if you take this weapon, then you see me as a friend and battle brother. Reject it, and you can't trust yourself not to use it against me, or break it and war will follow. Okay, cool. That's kind of like um, an ancient Viking custom as well. That did actually happen. In that, um, remember, have you ever played Skyrim? When, um, you know, if you're going down the Stormcloak line of, of Skyrim, I very rarely do because I'm not a filthy traitor, but like if you go down the Stormcloak line in Skyrim, um, what's his name? What's his name? The, the main guy. Ulfric. Ulfric, yeah. He gives you, um, he gives you an axe. And tells you to take it to the to the Yarl of White Run, and he says, you know, uh, two warriors will understand that well, what it means when one warrior gives another his axe, right? It means I trust you to hold on to this and not bury it in the back of my skull, right? Now the Yarl says, yeah, you can return that to Ulfric, all right? You can you can you can do, it. or is it the other way around? No, it is the other way around. It is the other way around. So the Yarl of the Yarl of, of White Run wants peace with Ulfric and sends him his axe, saying, look, you know. I trust you not to bury this in the back of my head. And your Ulfric says, uh, no, you can take that back to the guy who sent it and tell him I'll be with him very soon. And he attacks the city, right? That's a very Norse thing to do, a very Viking thing to do. And I like the law so far. Very, very, very nicely written. Very nicely done. Quite hard to read, as you said. You're dyslexic. I'm bypassing a lot of that. But if I do stumble across my words and I'm struggling... A little bit is because some of the words are jumbled up or, or some bits you can see all the red on here or some of the bits are, are a bit out of place and uh, you need my brain to to do the um, I'm like a filter you know what I mean I'm reading your stuff 
I'm filtering it through my brain and it's coming out of my mouth sort of a thing in a way that makes sense. But anyway, Gene Seed. I always like this bit. I like this bit. You write, do you know what? In, in a weird way, you write lore better than me. It's very concise. I know exactly what your chapter does. I go very grandiose in what I'm, what I'm doing when I'm talking about um, lore. Anyway, Gene Seed. Officially listed as a White Scar successor, but even as Grey Shields when posted on other units that are of the Great Khan's gene line, they never could quite fit in with them. With little things such as they can ride an Astartes pattern bike, as well as any other chapter's marines, but not to the standards of a White Scar, and they're more inclined to hold a defensive line than to lead a lightning fast charge to the foe. It has, it has called their lineage into question by the White Scars, but the Sons of Frey themselves are not overly bothered as to their lineage. For them, it's enough to be able to serve the All Father. The similarities between the cultures of the Sons of Freya and the Space Wolves has led to some to claim that they must be of Lehman Russ's bloodline. But investigation into the Sons of Freya's gene seed f uh, founding of the Space Wolves proves inconclusive, especially considering the chapter's gene seed shows no sign of the Canis Helix that is unique to all Sons of Russ. Okay, cool. Bit of mystery there. Um, one thing I would like you to say, maybe in an email, mate, is email me and tell me who the Sons of Freya are actually descended from. Let me see beyond the... Uh, let me be, Let me into the to the writer's studio here. I want to know what, what's going on behind the scenes. Anyway, organize it. Don't put it in your law, just tell me. You know what I mean? Organization. Organization of the chapter. They follow the codex, but do not follow it as religiously when it comes to tactics, as they feel if you always follow the same tactics, you can be outmaneuvered. The use of unconventional tactics has raised eyebrows amongst more stringent codex chapters, but have yet to come to blows over it. It is known that on one occasion, Gilliman himself did intervene on the Sons of Frey's behalf, stating the codex was never intended as anything more than a guidance and was never meant to be a religious text. It is not known to which chapter that Gilliman was explaining it this to, or how well it was received, but the Sons of Freya took it as license to diverge from his teachings at will. They do not use the tactical markings common through the other Astartes chapters. Instead, they use a colour-coded El uh, Elder Fodark, uh, Fodark runic system. Red for line battle, blue for fire, fire support, yellow for close support, and gold for veterans, but rank still follows the more codex patterns, and, and they have their company colour displayed on their left knee pad with a golden numeral rune emblazoned upon it, and refer to the to their squads as Vikings. Okay, so you let's just go for it. You say just call them Vikings. That's the, that's not a problem because Vikings was not a was not a, a cultural thing, right? Vikings didn't really call themselves Vikings. All right, Vikings was more of a a, a term for a group of warriors that came to mean an entire people. So you're actually using it in the correct term. When somebody says to, to, a, to a bunch of villagers, oh, you're all Vikings. No. No, that's wrong, right? That is wrong. They are Nordic peoples, right? They are Norse peoples. They are Scandinavian peoples, whatever you want to call them. Icelanders, whatever you want to call them, right? Norwegians, whatever. Norse would be a good way of putting it. But Vikings is a class of warrior, right? If somebody's born, they're not born a Viking. They're born somebody from this village in Scandinavia, right? So you've done it in the right way, and I quite like that. I wonder if you've stumbled across that, whether it's, whether it's an actual thing that you're, you're doing. Anyway, this is Battle Brother Drengear of the 4th Company. Like that. Like that a lot. Very nicely done. This part, very nicely done. I'm not going to do Battle Cry, because we'll be here all day. But I really do like the, uh, the art. That you've put on here very nice stuff um and of course going down here we have what what your ranks and titles mean the chapter master is the high king company captain is a jarl lieutenant is a thane sergeant is a huskarl veteran is an ulf head head nar i like all these apothecary is a bone binder of course of course i like it though i like chaplains are gothy yeah that, that's something that you've done here that that some writers also do You've used the word gothy without telling me what it means. You could even put in a gothy and then and then put into brackets, you know, a, an apothecary of the of of the sons of Freya, right? But nicely written, 
Well done. And have more faith in yourself, mate. This is really nicely written and very, very, very good lore. Let's have a little look at another few of your models of the Sons of Freya. Very nice. Very nice. Liking the look at them. Um, they are a bit... In terms of, of their conversions, you could go a bit further, I think. You know? Hmm. But I would be honoured to play against these on the tabletop. Absolutely honoured. Very nicely painted. Nice colour scheme. Stands out a lot. Good man. Absolutely brilliant. Brilliant stuff. Alright. Second chapter is on the way. And that is... Um, without a name, I think. I don't think we have a name on this next one. Let me just have a little look. Um... Right, this next one has no pictures, but it does have a lot of lore. And it's from Snooky. And Snooky, as you all know, is a friend of the channel. He is on the air quite a lot, doing some very funny hobby nightmares from his extensive time in the hobby. But he has sent me a logo for his chapter, which is pretty cool. And it's this. All right. Let me read out his lore and get to get to looking at this, shall I? So, um, dear Mr. North, Snooky here. First off, I would like to apologise if this email is not size 11 in font, it's okay, as I am on the phone and cannot find the print settings. Secondly, I hope everything is going well in your fortress monastery. I wish you and your kin health, happiness, and hordes of gold. Thank you. Hordes of gold would be nice. Oh, my days. Recently, guys, before I get into this, recently, I I've been trying to write different things aside from these standard fantasy um, fantasy settings, you know what I mean, just in my own time. And I've written quite a few things that I'm quite proud of, uh, but I just haven't been able to find something that clicks with me yet, you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden, I went back to writing grim, dark fantasy, and all of a sudden, everything clicked into place. I was like, yeah, I should be doing this. This is cool. I like doing this, you know? This, what, the one thing that really got to me was and this is just if you're a writer as well the one thing that really got to me that i really hated was the fact that i always felt like everything that i was writing had been done before do you know what i mean like everyone's done orcs before everyone's done dwarves before you know i can't be bothered writing that well now i am writing it and putting my own spin on it it's really invigorating and i know what a lot of people will be into it there's it's quite a cool thing of having people behind you going i love dwarves write more about that you know what i mean and because they they will read it you know so I've got my, my weirder settings and my other settings, but that's, that's where I am in my own writing journey right now, anyway, before we go into anywhere. You mentioned happiness and hordes of gold. Well, in terms of writing, I'm quite happy, and that's why. Anyway, let's get into his lore, shall we? I am here today to tell you about my homebrew chapter of Space Marines, the Sons of Theno. Suthano. Okay, you've actually written it in phonetics. Okay, Suthano. Okay, Suthano. The sons of Suthano. They are named after the strongest Gorgon in Greek mythology and come from the Iron Hand's founding legion. The sons of Suthano first began after the Horus Heresy, but not as a chapter, but as a separation. Members of the Iron Hand's following the Heresy event began to question codes and rules implemented by the Inquisition and Greater Mechanicus due to feelings of doubt, but not enough to be considered heretical. For example, and I quote, Huh, if all machines are sacred, and the ones we find were already invented, why can't we use already existing Xenotech? Unquote. And, and I quote, If the machine spirit needs to be pleased in all aspects of life and warfare, why do we perform rituals for bolters and armour, but not simple things like a bulkhead or a generator? Unquote. Along with, and I quote, is this demon blade, is this demon inside of a demon engine technically a demon spirit? Unquote. Ooh, that is kind of heretical, not going to lie. That is kind of heretical. Like, if you said that to a Mechanicus person, they'd probably shoot you. Uh, <laughs> just saying. Anyway, these questions and concerns were brought to tech priests and company veterans alike, but all were answered with something along the lines of, how dare you question the word of the holy insert religious figure here. So, these early members began to discuss in secret the questions of the machine. These meetings were hosted by a respected member of the chapter and veteran of the Horus Heresy, Rudolphus the Entombed, a title granted to him after he was placed in an ornate siege dreadnought following his death, quote-unquote, during the Horus Heresy. 
this group of around 175 marines began to wear a symbol of their independent group by colorizing one random piece of their armor plating and a mix in a mix of purple and orange purple and orange very bold in the early era of the 31st millennium when it was decreed that legions shall be split up into chapters this this questioning group of the iron hands leaped at the opportunity quickly establishing a base on a forge world in the segmentum obscura next to the cadia system and the eye of terror drink some tea here if you need it thank you you mentioned how you like to have some tea breaks here and there will be and there while reading a story i do so here we go right forge world prive had a similar philosophy to the questioning marines as it was discovered that the mechanicus of prive had been hoarding and discovering alien tech in exchange for not tipping off the inquisition the questioning marines were allowed to take part in the in the looting research and preservation of xeno science and technology oh forge world prive had a guiding philosophy that the machine spirit resides in all forms of tech and it must be preserved however they still maintain the idea that new technology is forbidden and not part of the omnisire's plan pre-crusade prive was a desolate and barren hunk of rock floating in space from the skies above it looked almost like tyranids had gotten to the planet except the atmosphere was still intact naturally this was the perfect place for a forge world as it turns out as the service of prive was transformed into a massive sprawling factory demolition teams dug down into the crust of the planet only to find not a rock and mineral but a sprawling underground complex of labs research stations and weapons development testing grounds as it turns out during the dark age of technology prive had been a dormant necron tomb world the Dark Age humans at the time took advantage of this and began to study and develop new and improved pieces of weaponry. As the security protocols began to turn on for the for the, the resting Necrons, le leaving them ripe for the taking. When the inhabitants found this, they feared discussing it with the larger Imperium and agreed to keep it secret. This lab is used now by Prive as a research facility and is more of a testing and upkeep than any actual in inventing the crown jewel of this great time capsule is a singular reva class titan this titan has only been used in active combat once and has been dubbed the name the gorgon's chariot now if i am not mistaken isn't a reva class titan a titan with an ai inside of it making it incredibly dangerous dangerous to the point of insanity uh, the only reaver class titan i know of in the law was destroyed by grey knights that's the only one i know of and it was destroyed because the ai inside of the titan had been corrupted by chaos can you imagine something that powerful and not only is a reaver class titan you know a titan but it's uh, easily the largest ever seen on record so a reaver class titan has been described as something that can barely stand on a planet's surface it's that big um that's a big piece of kit for your chapter to have access to <laughs> but i like the fact that i don't really use it that that is a thing that, that that's how you're getting around my law my law alarm going off in my head right that's how you're getting around it anyway moving on it was after discovering the secrets of, of the inhabiting mechanicus of forge world prive that the questioning marines began to call themselves the sons of Stano. okay to represent their brute strength of overwhelming firepower in battle it was at this time they began to add looted necron and eldar tech to their weapons and dreadnought suits the sons of steno are acclaimed in the cadian system for the strength of their dreadnought specifically and and might of their agreed upon chapter master rodolphus the entombed the sons of steno primarily defended mechanicus and other important guard outposts and mostly fight against demonic incursions that come out of the eye of terror and they are normally only called if things are getting so bad that they need space marine attention 
Okay, so the Sons of Steno would be another chapter that probably know of the Grey Knight's existence, right? I would say, if they're fighting demons all the time. Anyway, but they also, of course, call themselves arms should the planet or Mechanicus of Prive be threatened. Through years of brutal training and whirling cogs, through screaming metal and roaring engines, the Sons of Steno are more so devoted to the Omnissiah than to the Emperor himself. Okay. Are they not one and the same? Hmm. Enter the Fall of Cadia. Alright, cool. I'm just going to say, if your chapter master is still alive, then um, that is something you need to look at, because Games Workshop themselves have told us in black and white that Dante uh, of the Blood Angels is the oldest space marine living, right? So be very careful with... Um... In fact, no, because, because uh, Dreadnoughts don't count, right? Right, so you're fine. You're fine, because uh, the, the, the Space Wolves have that guy, don't they? Have that guy, um... Yeah, the, 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 the guy who tells stories. You know, the, the guy in the Dreadnought tells stories. I don't know. Anyway, they've got one, so yeah, I, this guy's fine. I just, my, my alarm bell was going off for a minute. Enter the Fall of Cadia. During the Fall of Cadia, in order to keep Forge World Prive from coming to the system's aid... A warband of word bearers assaulted the planet from all sides. With orbital defences preoccupied with trying to shoot the armada out of the sky, a swarm of chaos demons was sent down to the planet, and they began to decimate the chapter. Alarms blared throughout the Forge world, calling all available personnel to take up arms. With blood letters and pox walkers disabling the orbital defences, the sons of Steno pulled everything they had from their arsenals to combat the growing force. Some progress was made. Bombs shot from orbit and a, and, a, and a keeper of secrets closing in from the core of the Forge world, but the Suns could barely hold them back. As a last ditch attempt, already having hundreds of Marines slaughtered, the failsafe of the Gorgon's chariot was released, sending the great machine to the surface. Oh dear. Here we go. With traitorous firepower focused on the Reva Titan, the Dreadnought companies began to slowly push the tide back, re-establishing orbital defences. With weapons back online and the word bearers distracted with the Reaver Titan, the defence uh, system managed to take out the Armada, with only a few traitor ships escaping back into the eye. The battle was won, but barely. The great Dreadnoughts of Prive were severely damaged. The Gorgon's chariot was barely functioning. And the damage to Prive and its forge world were catastrophic. The next few weeks on Prive were a scramble to access as many Dreadnought cases as possible in order to preserve the lives of their fallen brothers. Rodolphus the Entombed, strong and experienced as he was, was wounded during the battle. Without the proper tech to repair his casing, he was installed into the mainframe of the Prive labs and factory. His Dreadnought casing lies implanted and connected right at the centre of the Forge world, watching all systems, monitoring all fleets, and scanning the skies with the now repaired and overclocked defence cannons. He was quite literally becoming one with the planet. The Sons of Steno developed a phrase following this event, and it reads, as I quote, As long as his heart beats, as long as his machine hums, as long as his cogs twist, our might shall not be contested. Unquote. In the following years, the Sons of Steno began to rebuild. Now they are still known for their unstoppable dreadnoughts, as the chapter is more dreadnought than marine these days. Those few, around 100, who are not inside of a dreadnought, adapt by wearing Terminator armour and piloting those warsuits, as well as sponsoring Imperial Knight houses to reside on Prive. In battle, they are incredibly slow, using the aforementioned dreadnoughts, warsuits, knights and terminators, they are called whenever an enemy, enemy refuses to retreat or surrender, breaking sieges whenever and wherever possible. Until they are called, they guard the Mechanicus of Prive as they venture into the stars looking for new tech using the few vessels they have. Rodolphus continues to guide the chapter, even as he is immobilised in the Forge World's core. Now to finish off their lore, a quote. And I quote, with iron on our backs, with steel on our hips, with cries in our throats, with hatred in our hearts, 
There is not a will we can't break. That is from Iron Father Shatter Shield. Debiles Tiamant Fortes. Let the weak fear the strong. Included is the emblem of the Sons of Steno. Well, Mr. North, what do you think? If it isn't that good and I'm still fleshing out the ideas, let me know. And please, be honest. All right. Your loyal listener, Snooky Fry. Mate, that was brilliant. That was a brilliant piece of 40k writing. That is better lore than a lot of the stuff you will read in official Games Workshop, um, in official Games Workshop, you know, magazines and books and codexes, right? That is better lore there than you will see in a lot of Games Workshop material. Absolutely fabulous stuff. Um, I hope if you're watching this video, guys, you're getting a real sense of what you can achieve with your Space Marine chapter. It doesn't need to be full of Marines. It doesn't need to be Codex compliant. It can be whatever you want it to be, as long as you fit it within the law. Uh, Maka and I were talking the other day about how Horus Heresy is a lot easier to write in than 40k is, which is why I'm much more impressed by people doing law like this in 40k and making it unique and making it work within the setting. The few strictures that you do have in 40k, you've used here, Snooky, to a really good effect to pull in the focus of your chapter to be Mechanicus and be this like, immovable object. I really like it. And it allows you to collect several armies at once. Do you want to collect Imperial Knights? Fine. Do you want to do Mechanicus? Fine. Do you want to do Space Marines? Fine. Do you want to do Dreadnoughts? Fine. All of that stuff is in the Sons of Stano. I like that. Brilliant stuff. Very, very, very good chapter. Um, starting to get a bit of chapter jealousy here. It's that good. Anyway, moving on to our next and final, at least for today, Space Marine chapter. All right. This one has no name attached to it because he, he asked me not to not to name him. So that's fine. Oh, not that one. Uh, we are looking at... Uh, where are we? Here we are. Here we are. Let me have a little look here. Do, 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 do. Alrighty. So, these are the Fire Templars. Alrighty. And when I first looked at them, I did think, oh my god, word bearers. Oh dear. But no, but no, these are the Fire Templars. Alright, let's read the lore, shall we? The Fire Templars. From the planet of, Ast of Astria... The Fire Templars carry the fury of Vulcan onto the enemies of humanity. Founded as a Primaris chapter for the Indomitus Crusade, the chapter has had a rough start. Being crushed at Ragol's depression by the Iron Warriors, the chapter is now in the process of recovering. Astria is a death world in the Imperium Nihilus. Slightly bigger than Holy Terror, the gravity and, tec and tectonic activity of the planet has created a hardy people. The day and night cycle of the planet is also way longer, taking about 72 hours for a day to pass there. The landscape of the planet is a desert of ashes with some lava lakes and, ba and basaltic plains. The nights are freezing cold and the day is burning hot, forcing the population to seek shelter in the Underdark. The Underdark is a vast network of caves and mineral-rich craters littering the planet, generally next to some magmatic hotspot. These magma lakes are the only places where humans have formed cities harnessing the heat for energy production. Forges and heat, things like that. The main city of the world is Ys. Y-S. Okay, Ys. I'm going to call it that. The fortress monastery called Hammerfall is at the centre of Ys and is built around the legendary archaeo-anvil left ages ago by the Golden Age of Humanity. It also houses the Temple of Fire, where the Templars worship the Emperor's flame. The fortress is built on a reactor, stabilizing the magmatic, the magmatic chamber of the volcano, but it can also be set to explode in case the fortress should be overrun. The Fire Templars have a genetic defect called the Fire of Call. When wounded and dying, the Marines' call furnace reacts abnormally, causing extreme pain similar to being burnt alive and produces an exceeding amount of healing and combat stimulants. This can cause a dying Marine to rise from extreme wounds 
with a barely controlled frenzy. They also possess an extra healing factor which makes them very resilient. Unfortunately, once a marine has known the rebirth as they call it, it is a slow degenerative sickness that will take them slowing their reflexes at first and then will slowly kill them. The Call Furnace becomes inactive and they slowly lose their Astartes like endurance over time. They call it the Touch of the Dagon or the Touch of the Dragon. I'm guessing that's not Dagon, it's Dragon, right? They call it the Touch of the Dragon. Uh, once one is touched by uh, by no no it is Dagon okay she it is Dagon all right I will go into that one then uh, they call it the, the touch of the Dagon once one is touched by Dagon he volunteers to do all the most dangerous missions and seeks an honorable death before the curse can overtake him death in combat is therefore seen as a boon to such a marine the abnorm this abnormality is believed to have been caused by the radioactive warheads launched at them at their first engagement with the Iron Warriors, although some speculate that Vulcan's perpetual nature may have interfered in Kor's manipulation of the Primaris Marines. Despite the chapter trying to hide this terrible flaw, some have already taken note of the odd amount of casualty rates in battle with a lot of, mar with a lot of Marines dying from their wounds three to four days after said battle but others seemingly unhurt, reported missing in action or dead. Okay. Okay. So this is a, a, a tragic chapter. How much pain does it take to send them into this spiral? Let me know that. That'd be a good thing to know. I like that. But anyway, moving on. Organisation and culture. The chapter is organised uh, as company named OSTs. I don't know what that means. The chapter is organised as, comp as company named OSTs. Ost? Is that an Ost? Again, some of these are pr pretty hard to read. The chapter is organised as companies named Osts. Each Ost is led by a Seneschal and each squad is led by a Paladin. The Battle Brothers refer to each other as Knight Templar or simply as a Templar. The first Ost is the Hammer whilst the rest is the Anvil. The first Ost is composed of the most skilled and rigorous individuals in the chapter. Each Marine is required to know the art of the Forge, and the most talented of them are called Forge Masters, an informal rank that still commands respect. The internal structure of the Order is also very driven by the oaths that they take. Knights are required to fulfil them in battle to protect their prom to expect promotion. A tradition is also the Behord or Arena Fight. Each team is composed of two Templars. One Astartes has a hammer and the other has a shield, and they must work together. The team standing the last team standing wins the contest. I like that. That's like a sport. That's cool. So one of you only has a shield and one of you only has a hammer. I like that. This is generally followed by the Vold Voldery, an act of devotion to the link of the Brotherhood forged in the arena. The two Astartes will drink from a cup mixed of their blood. This is what they call a blood bound. The Asmophagia generally is triggered by this and shows an image from the perspective of the other Astartes. The, that way the chapter makes sure its knights fight together with coordination and they build solidarity. Okay. So the, so the Osmophagia is the part of the gland in the Space Marine's body that allows them to essentially ingest the flesh of other people and regard their memories, right? But to do so, normally you have to eat their brain matter or do something very similar to see their, their you know, the world through their eyes or or see, like, a, a memory of theirs, right? But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to overlook that because it's, it's not really a big law crime, but we'll, we'll you know, just be very careful about, about messing with the, with the Astartes physiology and what it can do. But maybe yours is mutated and it works differently. If that is so, then make sure you put it in your law. Okay? That your o o Osma Fajaya is weird and it's corrupted in some way and it, and it allows you to... It's overactive. It allows you to see other people's memories just by drinking their blood. That'd be a good way of going about it, right? Maybe add that in and it'd make your law a lot cleaner. All right. The chapter also has a strong link to the population of Astria who lives with them. 
and it is a custom of the Astartes to meet their families before leaving for battle to receive from them their blessing. Some dreadnoughts sometime return to their grand grand niece or nephews to get this blessing. That's hilarious. <laughs> That's really funny. That's really funny. I love that. That's really... <laughs> You're just sitting there having your breakfast and the whole the whole hut shakes. You're like, is that is that brother brother Gaius? <laughs> you look outside and it's your uncle who's a dreadnought now. Alright? You know, like that's really funny. I must receive your blessing. You know, like <laughs> I love that so much. The chapter believes in the eternal conflict, a raging inner conflict between good and evil. The good residing in the flame of the eternal emperor of mankind, which represents truth, mercy for humanity and honor, and the deceitful thought that feeds chaos such as envy, compassion uh, for the mutant, weakness and wrath. By this definition, they believe psychers are already tainted by chaos and will lose this conflict inevitably, and so they eliminate them wherever they might be. It is therefore uh, primordial to win with honor and loyalty or die trying. Okay, that's cool. I like that. Okay. Uh, Fire Templars will never use tactics to sneak or to deceive an enemy, as to them it is losing the inner battle for the virtuous flame. This faith places them as very close to the Sister of Battle or the Black Templars. Some heretic texts will also draw comparison to the traitorous world eaters. Okay, right, okay. So you're going in a in a direction that is pulling your writing in more of a in more of in more of a ambiguous term. You're trying to you're trying to tell us where they land in the whole sphere of things. Okay. Alright. And the Templars who fail in the eternal conflict by sinning in battle, such as retreating, killing a, an enemy off guard, or any other deceitful act, become night penitents. They make vows of silence and are cast into exile to seek out a worthy foe to kill. If they succeed, they become night redemptors and are welcomed back into the chapter. I like that. I like that. What you should always try and do with, the, with these pieces of lore is... Um, put in seeds that other people can jump off from, right? Because right there, I already want to write a story or a book about one of those characters. About somebody who failed and then gets redeemed later on. That's a really cool aspect to your chapter and makes me want to write about them. Your law should always be open-ended like that. There should be a lot of jumping off points in your law for people to take and go, ooh, I'd like to write about that and then you jump off and go in that direction. Do you know what I mean? Very well done. Even my law doesn't do that. Not... not not to the not to the degree that I'd want it to, anyway. Alright. The chapter's relation to Mars has been tarnished over the years, as the chapter keeps forging different variants of bolters, power hammers, helmets, and even dreadnought chassis. Yeah, that's not gonna go down very well. This tendency to custom to custom build items also means the chapter has a very diverse and non-streamlined arsenal, leading to supply problems and difficulty to exchange with other chapters' more standard equipment. However, the equipment they do possess is generally of great craftsmanship and highly ornate, with flames and symbol of reverence. The chaplain of the uh, uh, sorry, the chaplain of the salamander that was sent to them uh, was unfortunately wounded at the, at the Battle of Ragol's Depression, and they turned him into a dreadnought. <laughs> Through his effort, the chapter has maintained very good relations with their parent chapter, the salamanders who, although they do not follow the same rigid knight code, are very valued and even loved brothers in arms. The Salamanders being the dominant chapter has shaped in many ways the Fire Templars closer to their image than other successor chapters. The most important character is Ragal Flamefist, the, the previous chapter master who still lives in the form of a Dreadnought. He is the master of the forge and the guardian of the flame. He has delegated his title to another survivor of the massacre, Coradus Tarchul. Okay, cool. I like it. The Fire Templars are currently tasked to protect Astria and the worlds around it and fighting a, thou and fighting a thousand suns incursion. Their armour used to be white and gold, but after the Battle of Ragal's Depression, they have changed their heraldry. They wear black helmets, black pauldrons, chain their weapons to their hands, and have a burned crimson body armour. Some have markings similar to the, to the Promethean cult, Due to the practice of the Emperor's Eternal Flame. Their motto is resist and bite, and their oath is 
I will protect the innocent. I will safeguard the pure. But what is evil I will destroy. What is tainted I will purge. For my holy ire is boundless. And that. Those are the fire templars. I like them a lot. I like them a lot. I think there's a, there is a lot to like about that chapter. Um, in fact... I think all three today have been absolutely superb in the way that they, they've, they've handled doing your own chapter. We've seen a few different ways of doing it too. Like with, with, the, with the Sons of Freya, we had one that stuck incredibly close to a current chapter in the Space Wolves, took that as, as inspiration, pulled a few things back that, 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 that he didn't like. Then Mark pulled a few things back that he didn't like and he added in things that he did like. To, and he made a chapter out of that, right? We had a completely new thing with it with the sons of, of steno right we had a completely new thing that was given to us there that didn't actually take any inspiration from chapters at all but instead took the, the bits of law that that person liked okay and threw them into a new chapter making something completely new and and above board right that really works too and we've got a middle ground here of the fire templars the middle ground is it takes a lot of uh, a lot of inspiration from another chapter, but again, pulls in a load of stuff that this writer finds, shall we say, inspirational. All right, very, very, very good stuff. I like it a lot, and uh, yeah, very, very, very impressed by our first set of Space Marine chapters. If you want to send me in some Space Marine chapters, you know where to do it. It is right there. It is hobbynightmares at gmail.com. Please preface preface your email with custom space marine chapter in capital letters or it won't be read out on the channel all right that's how i differentiate what you're doing with hobby nightmares that are getting sent in i'll be back tomorrow with some more hobby nightmares have a wonderful rest of your day very well done to the chapters that we've shown here today all of them have been brilliant in different ways all right cool see you tomorrow have a good one bye now